awes that he held. Leibniz, too, held a conception of nature grounded in laws. And central among those laws were laws that mandated the conservation of certain magnitudes, um, certain physical magnitudes in the world. Uh, now, like Descartes, Leibniz was quite comfortable talking about the laws of nature and, and talking about a picture of this world that is governed by these overarching laws of nature. Um, for example, the title of one of his most important publications, which gave rise to a controversy that extended well into the 18th century, was this, a brief demonstration of a notable error in Descartes and others concerning a law of nature. Um, and the law of nature was, in fact, Descartes' conservation of the quantity of motion. Uh, against Descartes, in, uh, Leibniz insisted that what was conserved was not motion, but force or power, the ability to do work. And uh, so, for example, in the preface to his work, The Dynamica, um, Leibniz writes, um, I have discovered that the power, potentia, of bodies does not consist in quantity of motion, that is, in the product of weight times velocity, um, and that in transferring power from body to body, the same quantity of motion is not conserved, as the Cartesians are greatly persuaded. Furthermore, I have discovered that this law of nature holds instead, namely that the whole effect has the same power as its full cause, so that one cannot obtain perpetual motion without violating the order of things through an increase in the power of the effect behind that beyond that of the um, cause. Now, the basic metaphysical conservation law, uh, which he called the, the, the law of the equality of cause and effect, has as a consequence a number of laws that are expressible in terms of magnitude and motion. The most famous of these, of course, is the conservation of mv square. But Leibniz also used the same principle supplemented by other considerations to prove a number of other laws. Um, in an essay from the early 1690s, the Essai de Dynamique sur les lois de mouvement, uh, Leibniz, the, the essay on, uh, of, of dynamics on the laws of motion, Leibniz derives three different laws of motion, including the conservation of absolute or living force, mv squared, conservation of respective speed, little complicated to set out mathematically, but Leibniz does, and the conservation of common progress, or momentum, as we now call it. Um, like Descartes, Leibniz is clear that these laws depend upon God. Um, in the Tentamen Anagogicum of 1696, he writes, all natural phenomena could be explained mechanically if we understood them well enough but the principles of mechanics themselves cannot be explained geometrically since they depend upon uh, more sublime principles which show the wisdom of the author in the order and perfection of his work. Though they depend upon God, it's clear that they depend upon God in a very different way than they do for Descartes. For Descartes, who rejects appeals to final causes and divine wisdom, the laws of nature flow directly from the divine nature. The constraints that follow directly from the way in which God sustains the world from moment to moment. That's Descartes. Uh, for Leibniz, though, they follow not from God as an efficient cause, but from divine wisdom, uh, from God as a final cause. Um, there's a canonical statement of the view in the theodicy, and that's that long quotation that begins, now the truths of reason are um, of two sorts. And I won't read um, 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 through the whole thing, but um, he talks about at the end of that um, a passage, physical necessity is that which makes up the order of nature. It consists of the rules of motion and in certain other general laws, which it please God to give two things in giving them being. Um, and then it's summarized later in the Theodicy uh, in a very um, uh, short passage, and this is going to be on the next page. Um, the laws of nature which govern motions 
are neither completely necessary nor completely arbitrary. The middle position to take is that they are the choice of a most perfect wisdom. Um, and so he writes to um, uh, Nicolas Ramond at the very end of his life, quote, my dynamics requires a work of its own. You are right, sir, to judge that it is in large part the foundation of my system. Since there one learns the difference between truths whose necessity is brute and geometric and those truths which have their source in fitness and final causes. So for Descartes and for uh, rather, and in a rather different way for Leibniz, the laws of nature depend directly on the activity of a transcendent God, either one who sustains the world from moment to moment or one who chooses what principles to impose on his creation. For both of them, and for many of their contemporaries as well, it's the order of God that determines the order of nature. But we might ask, what happens when we don't have a transcendent God to appeal to in order to fix the laws of nature? What then? And this, I think, is an interesting question with respect to our current time as well. And this is, I'll make a brief comment about um, 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 our own conception of the physical world. It certainly has gone seriously out of fashion to bring God into physics. You couldn't argue the way Descartes or Leibniz did um, today. But even so, modern physicists have no trouble talking about laws. And this, of course, is exactly the problem of explicating the idea of a law of nature, uh, the problem that has vexed, I think, philosophy of science in recent years. Being able to appeal to God makes life a lot simpler, of course, um, but it's fair to say that recent philosophy of science has made some real progress on understanding what a law of nature is. Uh, more difficult still is how, without God, one can appeal to notions like simplicity least action, and even conservation um, in physics. Why, for example, should we think that a simpler theory is more likely to be true? Descartes, Leibniz, and their theologically oriented friends had a pretty good answer to this. It's because God, in his simplicity, and, um, and the choices um, that could, he could be expected to make. Um, the answer is not, of course, foolproof. Uh, Pope Urban VIII, responding to arguments for the simplicity of Copernicanism, for example, argued that God could do as he liked and that simplicity was not an, infa an infallible mark of truth. But even so, it's easier to argue for such principles that are still very much part of the physical sciences if you can appeal to a transcendent God. But I don't want to talk about um, the state of the contemporary sciences or the contemporary philosophy of science. Uh, the problem of how to understand the order of nature without a transcendent God is a question that can be raised for contemporaries of Descartes and Leibniz as well. And at this point, I'd like to turn to two figures who excluded a transcendent God from their philosophies and examine how they dealt with the problem of the order of nature. And the two figures that I have in mind here are Hobbes and Spinoza. Um, the Descartes and Leibniz part is, I think, really clear um, and, and um, what it is that's going on, and I feel very secure about that. Hobbes and Spinoza were off into um, um, uh, much more difficult territory, and I'll be very interested in seeing what the rest of you make of these passages. Now, it's a perennial question, so let me begin with Hobbes. It's a perennial question whether or not Hobbes was really an atheist. Um, I, personally thought, I personally think that he probably was, uh, but it doesn't really matter for the issue um, that interests me, since whatever he may think personally about God and religion, Hobbes does not believe that God has any role to play in natural philosophy. In the De Corpora, and this is going to be the main source for that this is the main source for Hobbes's physics. In the De Corpora of 1655, Hobbes wrote, um, and this is the first Hobbes passage on page three, the subject of natural philosophy or the matter it treats of is every body of which we can conceive 
any generation and which we may, to any consider consideration thereof, compare with other bodies or which is capable of composition and resolution. That's to say, everybody whose, of whose generation or properties we can have any knowledge. Therefore, where there is no generation or property, there is no philosophy. Therefore, it, that's to say, philosophy, excludes theology. I mean the doctrine of God, eternal, ingenerable, incomprehensible, and in whom there is nothing either to divide or compound or any generation to be conceived. Um, and in this way, God has no role to play in Hobbes's account of the physical world. Um, but if God can play no role in the natural philosophy, how then are we to understand the natural order of things? Well, um, a striking thing about Hobbes's natural philosophy is that Hobbes seems to recognize nothing um, that he calls laws of motion. Uh, the term, I think even the concept is, but that, that may be a little debatable. The term is certainly not present. And I think even the concept is not present in Hobbes. Um, and that's, by the way, also true of Galileo. And I'd be happy to talk more about that in the uh, discussion period, a little bit surprising. Um, and this cannot be accidental. Uh, Descartes' Principles of Philosophy was published in 1644, the De Corpora in 1655, even though there are no explicit mentions in the later works. Uh, Hobbes certainly traveled in intellectual circles in which Descartes' thought was known and discussed. And in the De Corpora, there are more than a few passages that either address Descartes directly or appropriate ideas or approaches from his physics. Hobbes could hardly have missed the fact that the Cartesian universe is ordered around laws of nature. And in choosing not to present his physics in a similar way, I have no doubt that Hobbes was making a kind of statement about where he stood. He most emphatically did not want to structure the world around constraints on the behavior of things grounded in a transcendent God. Uh, given how closely the idea of laws of nature uh, were connected with the Cartesian theological approach to physics, it would have been very strange for him to adopt that idea. But despite the fact that Hobbes doesn't recognize laws of motion, many of the specific claims that Descartes makes and considers as laws of nature nevertheless have their echoes in Hobbes's De Corpora. Now, basic to Hobbes's physics is the general principle that only motion can cause other motion in the world. And since all change for Hobbes is local motion, only other bodies can cause any change in a body. And this is the statement of the claim and the argument that Hobbes offers. This is that passage that begins, there can be no cause of motion except in a body contiguous and moved. And then the rest of it is an argument for that position. I won't read through the argument, but if you scan through it very quickly, you will see, of course, there is no mention of God there. Um, now, this for Hobbes is a direct consequence of a claim stated and proved earlier uh, and this, this one is from chapter 9 of the De Corpora. The other claim is, um, uh, it's a direct consequence of a claim stated and proved earlier in chapter 8 that's very close to Descartes' first law. This is, this is chapter 8, article 19, which he mentions, if you'll notice, in the proof. Um, and this I'll read at least part of. Um, Whatsoever is at rest will always be at rest, unless there be some other body besides it, which, by endeavoring to get into its place by motion, suffers it no longer to remain at rest. Um, and then there is something of an argument for it, again, not appealing to God in any way. Uh, if you look at it, it's... Um, um, basically, um, a principle of sufficient reason. 
um, has no reason to go any place if it's at rest.